Yeah, I think uh, for people that were, you know, movers and shakers back then, they could see how the game is played. They can see how uh, the people at the highest level are able to uh, get a first bite at, at the fresh printed uh, fiat that's coming off the printing press. And so they had, some of them had an appreciation for what something like this could potentially usher into the world, um, Ford being one of them. Uh, okay, so let's talk about... Uh, Linear terms, log terms, getting off zero. Uh, give us some of your thoughts on on these ideas. Yeah. So um, one of the things that people unfortunately assume about Bitcoin is that it's a risk on asset. It's really volatile. Mm -hmm. That is true. And that because of that, it's a high risk speculation. And to their credit, they're not wrong in their worldview. It's just, respectfully speaking, their worldview is wrong. In the current worldview, something is volatile and something that goes up, you know, we, we all, in our current mindset, and again, in our ancient worldview mindset, uh, we have this view that when something goes up, it must inherently come down because what does everything do? Everything comes down because we can only make more. And uh, likewise, we assume because it's volatile, it's high risk because in a world where we have money managers and people that issue currency to keep stable prices, we assume something that's volatile against a stable political currency unit must mean that that's high risk because it's in relation to everything else. And so just coming into it, because our incentives and because our understanding of money has been so corrupted, we have trouble understanding uh, Bitcoin. But when it, when it comes to your question here, basically the, the important thing to understand is that Bitcoin is a piece of technology and it inherently is going to be volatile because it ex expands at an exponential rate and all technology is expanding at exp exponential rate for all of human history. So Volatility is inherently going to be a function. And the only time at which Bitcoin is not going to be volatile is once it's fully adopted. You know, I mean, you know, to take the internet, you know, if you had a price for the total value of the internet, it would be nothing but volatile uh, forever. You know, it would have been volatile during the uh, lockdowns of 2020. It would have been volatile in the tech bubble. It would have been volatile this whole time, except, you know, the fact that the network is increasingly volatile to the upside and becoming more valuable, you know, because you know, one can think of the internet as a communications network of the human race. One could think of computers as informational network of the human race. The electric grid is the energy uh, network of the human race. And Bitcoin basically as the digital economic monetary system of uh, the human race. So, so it, it, that, that's something that should be said first when differentiating um, between um, linear and uh, logarithmic view here. And, and to emphasize that point, let me give a little brief oh, oh you're pulling that up so so much in academics is taught that if there's volatility that's that equals risk and they're not yes. actually talking about like what's fundamentally i know when we talk about it with respect to equities i would get so frustrated with this idea that so many academics are saying well it's got all this historical volatility so it's a high risk thing and i'm thinking no it's a business and the underlying assets on the balance sheet of the business relative to all their competition's assets is where the real risk is lies. But it's almost like that's not even discussed. It's like, well, the price action was volatile, so it's risky. It's like, come on, give me a break. So when I'm looking at Bitcoin in a similar light, people are looking at the price action, they're saying it's volatile, but they don't even understand the beginning of the fundamentals behind it. They don't understand that there's second layer, immediate settlement, uh, you know, peer-to-peer -peer type things happening and and being just shared all over the world, they don't see any of that type of stuff. So just a little, just a little pet peeve of my own as you're bringing up the slide and yeah. sorry to interrupt you, but go ahead there. No, no, it, it's, it's fine. Frankly, it's a cheap cop out. And I yeah. can say that because yeah, I once, exactly. I once, I once believed that too. I ignored it for years because of that. Oh, it's yeah. volatile, whatever. It's like, okay, what if it, this replaces something? And then mm -hmm. that's, that's the slide I want to get to here is that what we have here are two lines. The first line being, it just a it, this is a conceptual idea here, but basically you have the Stone Age and and the Bronze Age, and of course, which system is more volatile when you compare these two systems? Well, it's the incoming age, it's the Bronze Age. And why is that? Is because it absorbs all the value, all the economic value of the previous system. Again, no yes. energy is created or destroyed, and then it creates new value. And so inherently, it has to be more volatile than the old system. And then if we go from the Bronze Age to the Iron Age, you know, again, thinking in terms of technological eras, you go from that ancient world, the Bronze Age, to the modern era of that time, the Iron Age, and it's more volatile than the previous system. And also it becomes faster because again, technology is exponential. It gets faster and faster. The number of lifetimes, number of centuries it mm -hmm. takes to upgrade 
uh, go down continuously. Go from the Iron Age to the medieval area, same thing. The same thing occurs. You go from uh, again to the Renaissance and age of exploration. You know the 15th, 16th century, the New World, and everything. Um, and then you have more recent history. You know the beginning of the industrial uh, era. You know the locomotive is one of my favorite metaphors for Bitcoin for uh, reasons I won't get into right now at this moment. But basically, you compare you know the Renaissance and that era of exploring the world and this massive expansion. Uh, you have this more volatile, much faster new era of the locomotive that the locomotive um, ushers in. Thank you so much for watching my content and being a supporter of mine. I really appreciate it. It's a lot of fun for me to do, and it's really meaningful to know that so many people are enjoying my content and learning about Bitcoin. I think it's so important for people to get off zero. In addition to getting off zero, it is really critical. It is really important that you also begin taking self-custody of your sats and of your Bitcoin. This is because if you have Bitcoin on an exchange or you don't have proper self-custody, this is going to be a massive problem for you in the future, most likely. If Bitcoin starts having rapid periods of appreciation and there are rapid spikes in demand for Bitcoin, for Bitcoin education, and for Bitcoin advocates and advisors, it's going to be increasingly important that you have self-custody of those coins. So my message to you is please consider getting that self-custody. Now, you can do that on your own. There are plenty of free tutorials online. There's plenty of great work like that. But if you want somebody to help you with self-custody, if you want somebody to help you take cold storage of your Bitcoin, of your Satoshis, if you want somebody to help you set up a multi-sig vault, to set up an estate plan, to set up a plan for you as a person, an individual, um, as a business owner, as a charity, whatever the case, I work at the Bitcoin Advisor, and I'm happy to say uh, that I, I really enjoy it. I love working with my clients. You know, my job is literally to help people uh, buy Bitcoin and secure it properly for years, decades, and generations to come. So if you want to learn about my services at the Bitcoin Advisor and what we do, you should click the link in the description. Uh, here you can see, read a bit about what I do. You can book a, a free consultation with me. You can book a free meeting with me. I'll send you lots of free complimentary paperwork explaining how multi-sig vaults work, cold storage, giving you all the education you need. Everything's fully open source what we do. Our main goal is education, helping get coins off exchanges, and people be able to not lose sleep at night when they buy and secure their Bitcoin. So you can feel free to book a meeting with me. The first one is free and complimentary just to figure out what your priorities are and get that adjusted. But if that's something that could be used to you, I, I really really highly encourage you to take self-custody, whether that's with me or not, please just do it. <laughs> but for the many of you that probably will eventually want a multi-sig collaborative custody vault, the Bitcoin advisor could be the place to go. And so click the link in the description, check that out. Really appreciate your time. And today, this is my argument of where we are today. And we did touch on this a little earlier, but what we have here is one line of the previous um, era, technologically speaking, of the industrial revolution, the era of the locomotive, of steel, um, and, and what we have here is the beginning of the information age, which, you know, arbitrarily we're marking at the beginning of the computer, or at least I am, in 1948, you know, we're, we're you know, half a century, well, more than half a century now uh, in, into the information age, closing in on a century here. And I, I believe we're only just beginning uh, the exponential curve, which I know might sound crazy to people, but again, about half the world has not used the internet. And once they do, you know, that, again, Metcalfe's Law, as you bring in more people to the internet, you create more value. We're only at the beginning. You know, there are still so many people that, you know, send checks, don't use the internet, even people that do have quote unquote internet access. Uh, that there's so much that is not a part of the internet yet that eventually is going to be, and the efficiencies will just continue. And so um, Bitcoin as a subset of the information age here, what we're looking at here is um, a system that's growing 80%, roughly speaking, uh, faster than the internet on a compound growth rate. So Bitcoin is growing faster than the internet. And that's that's one of people's big turnoffs is they think, well, Bitcoin won't matter to me until it's fully adopted. Well, the problem is, like I said, the internet's not fully adopted. And think about how much that's changed your life. You know, By the time Bitcoin reaches 15% adoption, your life's going to be radically different than it is today. Luke, when I'm looking at this, uh, and you, you've brought this up a couple of times about the internet not being all over the world to, to very many people, uh, and them having access to this information age that's, that's really starting to take off. When I look at what Bitcoin does in, in bringing the incentive structure for mining to these local communities all around the world and how it energizes First, those communities mm -hmm. gives them a, an economic incentivize and in, gives them an economic incentive to energize their local community. Yes. 
it then ushers in their ability to access all of this information and to access all of these tools that are readily available to people like you and me here in the United States. And it's almost like they go hand in hand together. Yeah, exactly. These different systems that are on top of each other that I'm referencing, they all reinforce each other. You know, the faster you adopt the energy grid, the faster you can upgrade to all these other things. You know, it's just a reinforcing. And and this is nothing new. This happened with the printing press, you know, back in that exponential curve of that era. You know, you bring in the printing press, you cause faster and faster change in, you know, the Catholic Church at the time. And you cause more political change. You know, it's it's how everything's connected. That when you have a new technology, uh, or especially a new network effect that compounds with other network effects, you get um, an exponentially greater impact on society, which then it impacts everything else um, with it. So again, it all comes back to um, technology here. 